Yeah, we'll start the recording. Okay. So, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, your be here in the session program comprehension five in XC 2020. In this session, uh, you are all well, super welcome. You have in this session four papers. And my name is Fabio Petrillo. I'm professor at the Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, Ecole Superior, Technologie Superior à Montréal. Donc, uh, so uh, you have, as I said, you have four presentations. Each presenter have around five minutes to present, but it's not super, super strict because... Hello. Hello, hello. Manuel, I can hear you super well. Welcome to the session. And uh, so we will follow this, this uh, sequence of the, in the research R. So I cannot see the first presenter. I don't know if uh, you are there, Puja or Sebastiano or Manuel. Uh... Juan Manuel is the first presenter and he's there on the screen. No, so... uh, it's the second because the first one oh, is the first submission. But I cannot see. So, as the people are now show. So maybe you can start with you, Juan Manuel. Are you ready to start? Uh, yes, let me just... Uh... So please, you can share your screen and you start your presentation. Here we go. Can you see my screen all right? You are okay, perfect, great. Okay. So, okay, uh, hello everybody. My name is Juan Flores, and I'll be presenting the paper, Retrieving Data Constraint Implementations Using Fine-Grained Code Patterns, which is a collaboration with my UTD colleagues, Jonathan Perry, Shi Wei, and Andy Marcus. So first, the main background concept that enables our research is data constraints, which are business rules commonly found in some requirements and they impose restrictions on the allowed values of the software domain. And here are some examples, uh, like blood type can only be one of these set values. In our previous work, we observed that data constraints are implemented in Java using a set of data definition statements and a constraint enforcing statement, which defines the logic of the constraint. Uh, we also uncovered that uh, the data constraints can be grouped into four types. And we started the implementation of, the, of the, these data constraints and come, came up with a catalog of uh, 30 implementation patterns, which is uh, also published. The one important observation is that 10 most frequent implementation patterns implement most of the constraints. And also that certain data constraint uh, types are most likely to be implemented with one pattern than others. For example, for the value constraint uh, implement, for the data constraint, I mean, value comparison uh, constraint type is most likely to be implemented with the binary comparison pattern, as in 91% of instances, this is the case. We leverage this fact by proposing a tool called Lasso, which for a given constraint, that is its constraint type, its context, its operands and the source code of the system outputs a ranked list of methods. And for each one of these methods, it ranks the enforcing statement candidates within them. It does this by using any existing traceability lane recovery technique and a set of AST based constraint implementation pattern detectors that we developed. Uh, we implemented 13 detectors for the most frequent uh, patterns and a detector traverses the AST and checks if a node is uh, an instance of CIP and if so 
it produces an enforcing statement candidate. Let's and use the following heuristics to rank the enforcing statement candidates. Each one gets assigned a score from zero to one. First, it feeds the data constraint context to the traceability and recovery technique. And the score is based on the rank of the candidates method in this uh, list. We also compare the percentage of turn overlap between the operands of the constraint and the operands of the, the candidate. We do it both ways to account for the case in which there's a high overlap, but there are unrelated terms. We also compare the overlap of the constraint operand and the candidate block, which is the set of statement that is executed after checking a constraint if the enforcing statement is part of an if or while statement. And finally, we check whether the candidate is of the pattern that we would expect for that constraint type. <clears throat> to evaluate Lasso, we propose three variations and we use each, well, the variations are uh, different traceability linear recovery techniques. And we use each one of these as a baseline for this corresponding Lasso variant. And the variants are uh, Lasso Lucene, Lasso Vector Space Model, and Lasso Latent Semantic Indexing. We used a data set of 299 constraints from eight Java systems in which the enforcing statement was uh, assigned manually as the ground truth. And the metric we focus on is percentage hits at N because it's easy to interpret. It is the percentage of constraints with ground truth in the first N method results. And the enforcing, we also interested in seeing how high Lasso ranks the enforcing statement within its corresponding method. The result shows that uh, Lasso outperforms all baselines, especially the weakest ones. Uh, it, it improves more uh, uh, against the weakest ones. And in about 70% of cases, it can return the correct method within the first 10 results. And even better, 80% of enforcing statements are retrieved in top three within their corresponding method. So in conclusion, Data constraints can be one of four types, can be implemented one of 30 implementation patterns in Java, and they're implemented in larger predictable ways. We define this technique called Lasso, which can detect the, the enforcing statements at both method and line of code level. It outperforms the baselines, and it can be extended in the future with additional CIP detectors for more patterns that might appear. And that's it for now, thank you. Thank you so much, Juan Manuel. Uh, so we'll go to the next presenter okay. uh, on the evaluation of neural code summarization with Enchain Chi. It's your turn, Enchain. Let me stop. And Shane, uh, you can share your screen and start your presentation, please. Hi, Shane. Could you hear us? Um, See him in this screen. Hi, hello. Shane. Hey, Shane. Hi, hello. It's your turn. Could you uh, could you present, please? Okay, sure. The button is uh, on the right left corner, left down corner. Thank you. Oh, can you? Oh, sorry. Yes, take your time. You can uh, just share your screen. Let's use a user point. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, but okay. if you okay. see your screen. We can see your screen. You cannot see your screen yet. Uh, uh, 
share my screen. Yes, now it's okay. Thank you. Uh, but you cannot see your slide. Yeah. No, now it's perfect. Now it's perfect. You so, can start. Uh, uh, so slides can switch to the next page. Yep. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Let's continue. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ansheng Shi from Xi'an Jiao Tong University. Uh, this work is done during my internship and Microsoft research Asian. And our work study some either overlooked but important uh, details and issue on the evaluation of neural customization. Uh, let's show some interesting findings. Uh, for evaluated metric, we usually use the blue score to measure the generated summary. As shown in figure one, uh, the generated rec the green rectangles represent uh, the different approaches and the blue obvious represent to the different blue variants. We can see that uh, there are many blue variants used in previous work. Uh, and for generate, uh, for the theme generator summaries, we obtain a rather different uh, uh, result. Okay. We, uh, for the theme generator summary, we obtain a rather different results and other different blue variants. And some paper directly compare uh, with other approach and a different blue metric. Uh, they could be incorrect or unfair. And other aspects like the pre-processing method, it also affects uh, the evaluated result. Table three uh, show the performance of 16 code pre-processing method. Uh, we can see that uh, the code pre-processing method have a large impact on the performance. And table four shows the performance of different model on different data sites. We can see that the performance of the same model is different on different data sites. And the ranking among the model is not preserved when evaluating them on different data sites. So, in this work, we like to answer how to evaluate and compare code summarization models more correctly and uh, comprehensively. Therefore, we select five code summarization models, uh, six blue variants, 16 code pre-processing methods, and 12 data sets. Each of selection is under different consideration. Uh, our work involves three aspects, uh, including uh, evaluated metrics, uh, code pre-processing method and uh, evaluate the data set. In each part, we review some overlooked uh, misuse or other details, obtain some rise of findings, and provide some actionable guideline. Uh, then we take the first part for an example. Table uh, four shows the performance of different metric score in two data sites, TLC and TLC uh, dedupe, uh, we can see that uh, there is a wide variance of blue metric used in previous work and the score of different blue variants are different for the same uh, summary. And the ranking of the model is not preserved used the different blue variants. Uh, for example, the AST or the uh, alternative GRU uh, is uh, it's great than code NN in terms of blue FC, but it's uh, it's lower than code NN in other uh, blue variants. Uh, under the blue FC measure, many existing models have scored lower than 20 on TLC deduced set, which means that the generated summary are not just clear and understandable. Uh, this means that we have a long way to solve this problem. And uh, after thorough analysis, we found that the blue variants are different in three aspects, uh, named the calculation label of smoothing methods and uh, packages in source of wear package. And later, we conduct the human evaluation and found that the, the blue DC is more relevant to human perception. More detail can reference our uh, paper. Uh, to facilitate the future research, we built a shared 
called Thumbray to box containing um, 12 uh, data sites for code pre-processing operation and uh, 16 better combination and 16 blue variants implementation or experiment results described in this paper and all implementation code for the paper results code. Uh, let's, and last, we conclude our work. In this work, we conduct deep analysis of recent neural customization models. We have investigated several aspects of model evaluation, including the evaluated metric and pre-processing method and data site. And we also build a shared customer toolbox to facilitate the future work. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shane. Uh, oh, yeah. Absolutely interesting work at the previous one. So, the third one now is Jane Bao with uh, FIRA find grained graph based code change representation for automated commit message generation. So, Jin Hao. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can yeah. hear someone. But, uh, could you please, in Jin, stop your share screen? Oh, okay. So I can close my presentation? Yes, please. Sure. Okay. Just now, Jin Hao. Could you please share your screen? Oh, uh, okay. Great, it's perfect. You can start when you're ready. Hello, everyone. My name is Jin Hao from Peking University. It's my great honor to introduce our work on automated commit method generation. Um, part one is the introduction of our work. Commit messages summarize code changes in natural language. They can help developers quickly understand the high-level intention of code changes. However, manually writing commit messages can be very labor-intensive. Therefore, commit messages are often neglected by developers. As is reported, almost 14% commit messages in 23,000 Java projects are empty. To alleviate manual efforts in writing commit messages, researchers have proposed various techniques to generate commit messages automatically, including template-based, information retrieval-based, and learning-based. Also achieving great performance, existing learning-based techniques have two limitations. First, edit operations are highly relevant to commit messages, but existing techniques represent code changes by simple by simply putting old version and new version codes together. As we can see in the example, between the old and the new version, the majority of tokens remain unchanged and only one token is added. Such cost grain representation causes information redundancy and the models have to capture edit operations by themselves. Therefore, we propose to represent edit operations explicitly so that models can precisely capture the differences between old and new version code. Second, developers often name a method or class with phrases, such as feature toggles and set tag listener in this example, and commit messages will contain the subtokens when code changes are relevant to the method or class. However, existing techniques mainly focus on integral tokens. Some techniques consider only integral tokens and ignore subtokens while some techniques represent all subtokens in a compound representation. For example, use GRU to process the sequence of subtokens and get one single embedding vector to represent all subtokens. Such cost grain representation of tokens limits the utilization of subtokens and make it challenging to generate commit messages containing subtokens. Therefore, we propose to treat all integral tokens and subtokens equally important and represent subtokens individually. Part two, I will introduce our proposed approach. We propose a fine-grained graph-based code change representation. It represents edit operations and code tokens in a final way. 
First, we build the chopped AST. In the code changes, each line starts with a change type, minus, plus, or empty. A hunk refers to the continuous lines with the same type. We propose to construct AST at hunk level. Second, we split integral tokens into separate, separated subtokens and connect them with their belonging integral tokens. Third, we further introduce edit nodes, including we add, we delete, we move, we update, and we match, which correspond to add, delete, move, update, and match edit operations. For example, in, the, in this figure, comparing the old LAN and new LAN, only one token is added, that is abstract. Therefore, we create a, create a we add node and connect we abstract to we add. Besides the ASD structure, we also add the sequential information, which can resolve the adjacent relationship and the order of the tokens. Finally, we merge them and obtain the final graph-based representation of code changes. In addition, we propose an encoder-decoder-based model to process the graph representation. We leverage a graph neural network as an encoder. The decoder is a transformer architecture with a dual copy mechanism, which can copy both integral tokens and subtokens from the inputs. Next, I will introduce the experiments we conduct. We have three research questions, overall performance, evolution analysis, and human evaluation. For ARC1, we can notice that our approach achieved the best performance in terms of all metrics. In ARC2, we built two variants, fewer edit manners and fewer sub manners. The performance of each variant decreases, which indicates that each component of our technique is effective. To further study the quality of commit messages from the we, we, we study the quality from the perspective of developers. And we perform a human study. We can notice that fewer output other techniques from the perspective of developers. Here comes to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Thank you so much, Hao. Excellent work, too. So uh, you have the last presentation. It's the first journal paper. I think it's Puja is there. You are in the uh, hello? presenter. Yeah. Thank you so much, Puja. I'm sorry because I think you were arrived a little bit. Uh, I, I didn't see you on the, on the list, but now is your time to present your first journal. Uh, journal first article. What do you class comments tell us? An investigation yeah. of comment evolution and practices in Faro small talk. It's your turn. Thank you. Uh, let me just see if I can share my screen. Perfect. Take your time. Uh, Last but not least. Uh, I think I have to keep the permission until it's quit for Google from uh, I will log in again. I think I will need one more minute. I think so. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Sure. Take time. I think it's, it's an issue with the Mac OS. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you have to keep the power shot. So it's part of the virtualization, virtual conference, some technical issues, but it's uh, maybe just wait a little bit because in fact you're not super hurry you did a great job to present on time your work so congratulations you have uh, around uh, near to 30 minutes to discussion so you have time to wait a bit Puja. i however i hope that she can back quickly during that, maybe you can, uh, the idea is just to have the presentations after starting the discussion. How, Puja? Are you okay now? Uh, yeah, now I can see your screen. Excellent. Uh, which screen do you see? Can I know your like the- Your presentation, your great presentation. presentation. Okay, thank it's you. It's your time. So, uh, 
Thank you. I'm sorry for the hassle and thanks for giving me time and be patient with everyone. My name is Pooja Rani and I'm currently a postdoc at University of Bern, Switzerland. And welcome to my general first presentation for the paper, What do Class Comment Tell Us? An Investigation of Comment Evolution and Practices in Far Small Talk. We have done this work together with Zurich University of Applied Science and University of Auckland. So moving to what are class comments. Uh, a comment is a programmer readable annotation or an explanation added in the source code of a program and developers generally write comments to explain the rationale behind their code or to present the overview of their code. Now studies, various studies shows that high quality code comment assist developers in various program comprehension or maintenance tasks. However, different use different conventions to write comments you must be aware of that you have seen that in there are different symbols to denote comment there are different style to write in small talk it's uh, comments are written in a very different style so if you look at it the code comments are actually written in a separated window apart from code and then also it's written in a specific window which is basically not mixed with code <clears throat> They are also written in different style compared to other languages. So here in the first line, it's written using first person pronoun that indicate the intent or summary of the class. Then developers also write examples on how to use this particular class. So in class comment, not that they describe the summary of the class, but also how to use this class. And interestingly, in small talk, they also write implementation detail, which is basically since class comments are in source of documentation, developers have made different kind of information, ranging from a design level information to low level implementation detail. Now, all these things, although are interesting, they also present a lot of challenges since class comments are main source of documentation. Developers embed different kind of information. Also, they do not really use any strict comment convention such as tags or annotations. And they're not enough quality assessment tools to see how what is there in comments. So using previous techniques from other environments like Java or Python becomes a non-trivial task and it requires a lot of empirical knowledge to actually migrate this technique to such environment. So in this paper, we basically studied class comments and mainly from three perspective to see, OK, what developers are writing in comments in association with comments what information they're actually writing, and do they follow some kind of template or style guideline to write comments or not? So for this study, we used Faro environment, which is a live programming environment for Smalltalk software systems, and it's written in Smalltalk. Now this system first appeared in 2008, so it was perfect for us to study a long history to analyze Smalltalk comments. Now, moving to results, what we saw is that 50% of the changes in com comments, especially class comments, were related to code changes. For example, if a developer added a method, then this also triggered a change in comment. Either they went to explain that, okay, what they have added, or they also went on to make it more readable. Then, now once we know that how developers were changing comments and what they were changing and what they were not changing, we wanted to see what they were actually writing inside this, what information they are actually writing inside comments. So as I saw previously that a comment can contain different kind of information from high level design to low level implementation detail. However, there was no this such taxonomy for small talk comments. There is uh, for Java and Python, and we wanted to see uh, and or extend this to Smalltalk also. So what we found is the developers write three, three types of information, just like a huge spectrum to see that how different information they can they can cramp into small comments. They were writing high level design overview, and also there were conversations exchanged into into this class comment which was also interesting for us to see that it's not just a uh, just a platform the rationale is also a platform to exchange ideas then next in this study we move on to the another perspective that while writing this information do developers follow some kind of guidelines and this was an in, uh, an interesting way to see here because in small talk in Faro environment developers are provided with a default template to show them how to write a class comment 
which is basically none other than a class responsibility collaborator design scheme. So in our study, we measured that how developers come and adhere to the template or how much do they follow this template. What we found is that uh, there are certain type of informations which are suggested by template to write and all of them are pretty frequent in developer comments and actually more frequent than other types of information. So as main takeaway, I would say we found that okay, developers submit different type of information in class comment and then they write template inspired information type more often than other. This basically provides us opportunity to see what information is important for developers and what we should extract. The ultimate goal of automatically assessing comments is still far away, but at least we are going positive in the direction that now we need to know what information is important for developer and how do these information types support developer in what particular task and how to extract them automatically would be the next immediate step for us and with that i would say thank you very much the paper is available and replication package is available on github please contact and i'm happy to answer your questions thank you very much Thank you so much, Pooja, and all presenters did a super great work and super interesting discussion that you can develop now. You have just on time, you have time to discuss, to share, and to explore more of the subject that you did. So uh, maybe you. you can start by the questions are in the chat or the discussion are in the chat. Because Muhammad said, uh, how difficult will it be extend your work to know strongly typed language like Python or JavaScript? Uh, I have a good news on that. So I can actually, in my case, I can actually show that, that we have, um, there are a work from uh, Pascal in Java and for Python. And uh, in my another work, not in this work, but in my another work, we actually tried to map those uh, those informations which developers were writing to see that how similar information developers write across languages. Although this is not part of this work, but it will be did in another work. And this we could see that okay, the work can be extended to other languages. Oh. That's it's great, Puza. It's it's nice because all works that's super related. In fact, Muhammad's questions was to one Manuel, but it's it's absolutely amazing that you have the same. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm it's okay. No problem at all. No problem at all. We are here just to to discuss. Maybe could you please uh, stop your share screen oh, yeah. because yeah. we can be more in the full room. Okay, thank you for answering the question. Uh, Juan Manuel, what's your Okay, so about? as I as I already answered in the chat, there's a I mean Lasso is based on a pretty basic static analysis. It is it uses a ST analysis to detect these uh, pattern types which are uh, which are pretty well defined we define them with a grammar. So mm -hmm. it, what this would what this would take to extend to other languages would be to extend the catalog of patterns to those languages because we that we, we will find similar patterns in other languages but uh, we have to actually uh, define those patterns first because for example in, in python usually you don't check for mm -hmm. null like equals equals null instead you do not uh, mm -hmm. something not variable so that would probably be a pattern mm -hmm. that is different in, in Python that it is in Java. But after those patterns are defined, uh, these AST-based detectors are pretty easy to implement. They're only based on uh, this uh, AST analysis and they use a little bit of uh, variable resolution, which it can be achieved with uh, language allows. So the conceptually, it wouldn't be any more difficult. It would just require this, this effort of defining the, the catalog as such. Great. Mathieu, do you have also a question maybe you can do for Juan, uh, Juan Manuel? Um, yeah, I had a question actually in the same, the similar vein. Um, so yeah, I think it was interesting to define patterns 
really in terms of AST, which gives a lot of flexibility. Um, but then how um, either for the patterns that you derive or for new, maybe a project specific patterns, how much effort is required to really find the right AST template that really like captures the implementation pattern that you want without being too specific or too general? Um, does it need a lot of iterations or is it fairly straightforward to define those patterns? Okay, so yes, I am. As I understand, you're asking how difficult it is to define the pattern itself. So what it, when I talked about the extending the catalog, you're asking how difficult that would be, right? Yeah, essentially. So it does require the analysis we performed to define these patterns was uh, mostly syntactic, as in uh, we, we took the type of uh, construct that the uh, implementation appears in. So it could be a, a Boolean expression or a method call or a, a, a binary comparison that when an oper operator. But uh, it's mostly syntactical, so if, if they appear in different constructs, they're probably going to be different patterns. That's easy to tell. But in some cases, you might want to split uh, things that appear in a single and the same construct if they have specific semantics. For example, in Java, we had when we compare two things, uh, A equals B is a different pattern uh, from comparing A equals null because we we consider that to have its own semantics. So that uh, really depends on what uh, what's usually done in the language. It's a uh, it definitely it's a uh, since it's it was defined using open coding. It depends on how this process is carried out, but we're confident that it is uh, it was uh, carried out correctly because, as we saw, there is this relationship between the types and the patterns. And the relationship uh, seems pretty clear that some patterns implement some types more often than others. So it does, I think it does require this. Uh, it's mostly syntactic, but it, it has a little bit of semantics that you have to consider for each pattern. All right, thank you. Thank you much, thank you, Han Manuel. But Mohamed, you have one question maybe you can do for Shi. Uh, she, uh, I have asked the question in the chat box, I think. Uh, uh, do you have any plan to extend your work for other metrics which you do, like Meteor or Rock? Oh, oh OK, thanks. Uh, in, in fact, uh, we have evaluated uh, all the results under this metric. And uh, uh, all the findings and the conclusion in our paper are held for this metrics. And uh, uh, because the uh, space limitation. We put the results in the appendix and I put the link to these results. We, we obtain ob about uh, uh, 70 uh, tables and uh, a lot of figures in our uh, studies. And you can uh, click, uh, you, you can to ref, uh, reference our report to get more results. So, uh, uh, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. So maybe someone in the audience, if you you are free to, you can just open your microphone if you would like to do some questions. You are friendly session, okay? If someone would like to to do some questions, if not, maybe you can. I will. I would like to propose one maybe round table discussion quickly to say how we imagine the effort or difficulties to integrate your approach as an IDE or in the life cycle of developers. developers. Because sometimes you have an approach to, to propose or suggest how, how we imagine to integrate that in the life cycle. Maybe Jin Hao, you have some thoughts to share? How imagine to introduce your approach in the life and the life cycle of developers? Uh, okay. Mm. 
um, uh, because uh, because in the um, left cycle of uh, software, um, developers may may um, commit their um, uh, submit their commit um, very frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, our our approach our approach our pro um, approach um, can uh, can. Um, I recommend the commit messages um, for them when um, uh, each time they uh, submit the commit, um, and uh, and and they can um, modify uh, the uh, our recommended commit message, um, and this will save um, efforts um, for them. Okay, and Puja, what do you think about the effort to introduce your approach to uh, developers and to introduce in the day-by-day -day work? I think we still need to do quite much work, especially for natural language uh, mm -hmm. uh, tools, because since they are, although there there is quite much advancement, it is still not still not at that stage that where they would be giving right feedback to to developers so although it's uh, what we can do is and we also in our approach is that we could extract some important type of information and we can present that to developers and that's uh, that's not that difficult however the thing is how do we reduce noise because at one point we want to help developers but at other point we don't want to annoy them also with a lot of information and and uh, at least for my work, that's a big challenge, how to identify the important pieces and how to identify what is important for whom. Like some people who are like new developers, they might be interested in detailed documentation while senior developers might not be interested in actually scrolling the whole documentation. And then how do we show them only the required part in IDE and not annoy them with, with full-fledged plugin which is coming up here from all around to poke them great and uh, she you think that for your side what you imagine to introduce your approach and in chink so I think it's not so <laughs> connected. And uh, Juan Manuel, what do you think about to introduce your approach to developers? Okay. Yeah. I'm not, okay. So our approach, uh, the the major point of improvement that we have right now is that our approach requires the developer to manually select the constraint context, the operands, and the type. So being able to uh, not only identify constraints in a text automatically, but also extract these as info region from a text would be ideal since it would be able to, it will make class so able to identify the implementations complete, uh, completely automatically. Mm, let's see, uh, well, the tool is, uh, it's a, it's a traceability link recovery tool, which means it works on on a system that is uh, when the code is more or less consolidated. But there might be ways to implement the approach on uh, and the, during the development so that developers get feedback during mm -hmm. uh, during the. For example, if we find constraints in a in a in a uh, feature request that maybe the feature request was implemented and it touches a lot of classes. So we might be able to use our tool to pinpoint the exact lines of code that implements constraints in that feature request to just providing a, a more rich level of traceability. So not only when the trace needs to be retrieved after the fact, but also when the system is still in development and it's being changed. Interesting. But Juan Manuel, I have one question for you because I read your page, I think, oh, super interesting approach to to the integrate an IDE and people.
but also for MSR, for mining software repositories. Could, do you think that you can apply your technique just also in repositories, not just in one single project? Of course, this is uh, something that we described in the in the previous publication, mm -hmm. is that now that we have identified these patterns, we can do all sort of, or all sorts of mining with them. We can uh, mine uh, commits to identify, uh, for example, be able to identify the text of the constraint. So if we know that the pattern appears in a commit, we can check the, the commit message to see if we can match the constraint there. And also we can check uh, bug prone commits. I mean, but uh, commits that introduce bugs. And if we identify that one type of constraint, I mean, one type of pattern is most likely to implement a uh, bug, then that is something that we can note as well. Since these, these are so easy to detect in AST, we can perform all sorts, all sorts of mining using them. Yeah. And uh, Mohamed, you have a question to in Jin Hao. Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, 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 so, what will be the main challenge between code summarization and code change summarization? What do you think? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, beg your pardon. The question is what will be in the main challenge between code summarization and code change summarization, in your point of view. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, thank you. Mm, um, in my opinion, mm, the, uh, the challenge for code change summarization is that um, besides the info, besides the, uh, uh, besides um, the code information, uh, the difference um, between um, the old version code and new version code um, has to has to be captured by the um, models. And uh, because um, and because uh, uh, sometimes uh, the uh, the modifications between the old version and new version um, uh, in, uh, might be um, Manner and and uh, uh, most of the um, uh, tokens uh, remain unchanged. Um, so, um, so uh, the models, if putting the uh, old version and the new version code together, the model have to um, capture the um, minor uh, modification by themselves. Uh, so, um, uh, so. Uh, so, um, so we propose to um, um, uh, uh, represent the uh, modifications uh, explicitly. Um, uh, I, I, um, uh, I think uh, uh, the, this is the um, uh, biggest uh, uh, challenge uh, for code change summarization compared to code uh, summarization uh, because of the existence uh, existence of the um, uh, difference between the old and the new version code. Thank you, Kelly. Absolutely. So I don't know if you have more questions. And I don't have any more questions. Uh, yeah. I think there is some question from I can share some of near uh, on the main challenge uh, on the code summarization uh, because I'm very familiar with the code summarization. Great. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. From from my uh, perspective, I think uh, there are uh, there are three main challenge on the um, uh, code summarization models. Uh, the first is a suitable model for code modeling. Uh, as we all know, many deep learning based model uh, treat the code as a sequence. Uh, in other, uh, let's say to see, uh, they will get the embedding of each tokens and aggregate all the 
token embedding to get the final uh, semantics of the code. And uh, in this processing, the variable, the semantic of the variable name is very important. Uh, however, when we change a variable, uh, change a variable name, or we uh, normalize or, or, or normalize all the variable name, the behavior of the source code uh, does not change. Uh, so, how to process, uh, pr uh, process and uh, model the variable name? It's very important if we can uh, uh, solve th this problem. Uh, I think the more benefit we, we can get, we can obtain. The third is a uh, high quality data set. If we um, sample a small data set and uh, uh, see and, and see it, we can find that uh, many uh, summary and uh, uh, cannot. Uh, 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 cannot reflect the functionality of the source code or some commit message uh, do not reflect uh, do not uh, represent the intent of the developer uh, sometimes uh, there are some no nodes for example this code cannot run in on the Linux or this code have s some bugs uh, or for commit message they just uh, uh, type some words like a uh, uh, fixed tempo or or small fix or fix something. They are too general. Uh, so so, uh, but but the data is very important for machine learning. If the data set is uh, a poor quality, the model cannot learn the good representation. So we need a high quality data set. Uh, the third is where consider the automatic metric is debatable to use. Uh, uh, the uh, this existing uh, the metric like blue a meter sender because they are test similarity uh, they, they are test similarity based but uh, the intent of the develop, de developer can be uh, exp expressed in various ways so if we if the model generates the uh, the true intent or the true summary, but the 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 evaluation, uh, the, the processing of the evaluation cannot uh, uh, think this is a true answer. They will give a low score, uh, so it's it's not a, a good way. So we need a well consent the uh, uh, metrics, but uh, if we uh, let the developer to uh, to label uh, the answer is true or not it will be cost so we, we need a well consider consider out metrics so I, I think this uh, first uh, uh, first point uh, uh, first point are the main challenge for code summarization and the commit message generation yeah absolutely Thank you. points and uh, someone else could share some questions or comments, observations, uh, because uh, uh, I, I have yeah. a, uh, I have a question. Um, uh, I want to um, talk some uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, the uh, code code summarization and the code change uh, code commit message generation with ancient. Um, because I think uh, our topics are a little uh, similar. Um, I have um, I have ever seen a, a, a empirical study uh, on uh, code summarization. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, in this paper, uh, the author says that um, the uh, the the mapping between input and output and um, um, uh, uh, in other words, um, the same input will not always generate the uh, same output in in the um, code summarization task, and um, and because the um, uh, uh, because the um, uh, similar similar code a uh, similar code may have um, um, a very different uh, uh, summarization. Uh, I, uh, I I I miss this uh, I miss this problem also in the commit message gen generation. 
because I think uh, uh, the the code the code uh, related task is different from um, machine translation. Um, the similar uh, the similar um, the similar code uh, may uh, will not always uh, correspond to the same output. Um, uh, uh, um, I, 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 uh, for example, uh, in the uh, machine translation, the so uh, the the sentences the sentence consists of uh, several words, and the same word in one language always generate uh, the same word in the target language, but in the code related task, this is uh, this uh, is not always true. Um, so I I have some um so so I want to, uh could, could you please um um say something uh, your uh, opinion uh, about this? Oh yeah, I, I agree with you. The variable name is very important, but uh it, it's it's not the fixed meaning. Uh, for example, when we in the uh in the function hey in the function which is do uh some uh so it, it will return a plus b and uh, we can change the variable name to c and d so if a function returns c plus d it's also uh it's also do do the function of sum uh, so the variable name in in source code is different uh, with the word in the natural language, and uh, it's also a difficult. Uh, it's also a challenge for us to modeling the variable name well. Uh, yes, yes. I think uh, uh, this is because uh, uh, the uh, the complexity of the code. It has too many formats. Yeah, but in actually there is an, another point. They, they think uh, uh, the many developer uh, tend to arrive a meaningful variable name. So if we treat the variable name as a words uh, as a sentence words, it, it's also. Uh, it it is it, it's also benefit for neural network to moderate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Really great discussion, and uh, so we have just uh, maybe one last quick answer or discussion comment question. Someone else. Uh, so, if you don't have more questions, I would like just to thank so much the, and congratulations for the authors. You did a great job. It's really a passionate topic, and uh, we can stay here talking, discussing hours by hours about that. Absolutely amazing work. And I hope that you enjoy XC2020 and the audience too. You can stay around and uh, socialize and discuss, keep in touch. And you have tons of great talks to, to participate in the Tao Hao now and uh, also the other events around. Okay. Thank you so much for all. And uh, you're just closing the session. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for Thank you. participation. Thank you. See you. Bye bye. Nighty night. <laughs> it's time to sleep. Time to sleep. Congratulations. And relax. Nice. <laughs> Congrats. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.